God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. We've seen that Jesus Christ is fully divine and therefore God the Father's rightful heir to the universe. Paul and the author of Hebrews continue to unveil several more implications of these realities. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 explicitly names Christ as creator of everything. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. He is not part of creation. He is the creator, the very arm of God, active from the beginning in calling the universe and all creatures into existence. John 1.3 says, all things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That could not be true if he were himself a created being. Hebrews 1-2 also identifies Christ as the Creator. He is the person of the Trinity through whom also God made the world and for whom it was fashioned. One of the greatest proofs of Jesus' divinity is his power to create everything material and everything spiritual. Think of what that means. The expanse of creation is staggering. Have you ever reflected on the size of the universe? If it does not impress you on the majesty of God, you have not really considered it. A ray of light travels 186,000 miles per second. So a beam of light from here will reach the moon in a second and a half. Imagine traveling that fast. It would take four years and four months to make it to the nearest star. Traveling across our galaxy, the Milky Way, would take you about 100,000 years. If you could count the stars as you travel, they would number about 100 billion in the Milky Way alone. If you wanted to explore other galaxies, you would have billions to choose from. Where did it all come from? Who conceived it? Who made it? It cannot be an accident, and the Bible tells us its maker is Jesus Christ. Jesus holds its primacy over creation because he is before all things. Colossians 1.17 When the universe began, he already existed. John 1, 1 and 2. 1 John 1, 1. He told the Jews in John 8.58, Before Abraham was born, I am. He identified himself as Yahweh, the eternally existing God. The prophet Micah said of him, His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Micah 5 2. Furthermore, Paul added that in him all things hold together. Colossians 1 17. The author of Hebrews confirmed Paul's declaration. Christ upholds all things by the word of his power. The Greek word translated upholds means to support or maintain. It's used here in the present tense, implying continuous action. Everything in the universe is being sustained right now by Jesus Christ. He maintains the delicate balance necessary to life's existence by quite literally holding all things together. He keeps all the entities in space in motion. He is the power behind every consistency in the universe. Can you imagine what would happen if Christ relinquished his sustaining power over the laws of the universe? If just one of the physical laws varied, we could not exist. 
Consider the resulting destruction if the Earth's rotation slowed just a little, or if it moved any closer to or farther from the Sun. How does our world maintain such a fantastically delicate balance? Through Jesus Christ, who sustains and monitors all its movements. The universe is a cosmos, not a chaos, an ordered, reliable system instead of an erratic, unpredictable muddle, only because Jesus Christ upholds it all. Knowing that, how could any Christian not bow before him to love and adore him? Christ also is the creator of thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, Colossians 1.16. Those terms refer to the various ranks of angels Christ created. The writer of Hebrews also made a clear distinction between Christ and the angels. Of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Hebrews 1, 7 and 8. Scripture is clear that Jesus is not an angel, but the creator and master of the angels. Jesus' relation to the unseen spiritual world, like his relation to the visible universe, proves he is God. Paul continued his treatise on the preeminence of Christ with four great realities about his relationship to the church. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Colossians 1.18 First, he is the head. Scripture uses the metaphor of the human body to describe the church, and that means Christ is the head of the body. The church is not merely an organization, it is a living organism, controlled by the living Christ. He rules every part of it and gives it life and direction. Because he lives his life through all the members, he produces unity in the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20. He energizes and coordinates diversity within the body, a diversity manifested in spiritual gifts and ministries. He also directs the body's mutuality as the individual members serve and support each other. See verses 15 through 27. Second, he is the beginning. Ark, beginning, refers to source, rank, or primacy. It can also be translated chief or pioneer. Since Christ is both the source of the church and its chief, the church has its origin in him. God chose us and him before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4. As head of the body, Jesus holds the highest rank in the church. As the beginning of it, he is its originator. Third, he is the firstborn from the dead. Earlier we discussed the meaning of firstborn. Of all those who have been raised from the dead, or ever will be, Christ is the greatest. Fourth. He is the preeminent one. Much is made of acquiring first place in our day. From sports to business, the goal of teams and corporations is to be number one. But there is only one who truly holds first place. As a result of his death and resurrection, Jesus has first place in everything. As we conclude three days of examining the absolute supremacy of Jesus Christ, we consider Paul's summation of his argument in Colossians 1, 15 through 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Pleroma, fullness, was a term used by the later Gnostics to refer to the divine powers and attributes, which they believed were divided among various emanations. Paul's point was that all the fullness of deity is not spread out in small doses to a group of spirits, but fully dwells in Christ alone. In Christ and in him alone, we are complete. Christians share in his fullness, for of his fullness we have all received, in grace upon grace, John 1 16. All the fullness of Christ becomes available to those who place their trust in him. 
God says his son has first place in all things. What does that mean to you? It ought to mean everything. To reject him is to be shut out of his presence into an eternal hell. But to receive him is to enter into all that he is and has. There are no other choices. If you are to ever regain your first love, it is absolutely necessary for you to acknowledge that Jesus does in fact have first place in everything, including your life. You do not occupy a position of prominence, only he does. The sooner you recognize that, the quicker you will begin to reestablish your love for him.